Louisiana Legends is made possible by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. This important program series enables us to discover, through the accomplishments of our fellow Louisianians, the unique character of a state so proudly served by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana for 60 years. To be the best at anything is an astonishing accomplishment. Well, I'm with the best today. The best collegiate baseball coach in the world. The winner of four World Series. Man who created a dynasty, which is quite a trick itself, here in Louisiana. I'm with, of course, who else could I be talking about? Coach Skip Burton. Hiya, Coach. Hello, sir. Coach. You're a young guy, you're in Miami. How do you get into coaching? I mean, there's so many occupations that uh, must have occurred. I'm, I'm a fortunate guy, I guess. I was uh, always wanted to be a baseball coach at a very, very young age. I knew that's what I wanted to do. I had a mentor uh, I grew up with by the name of Max Sapper. Uh, he was at the park where I grew up, and he had played some pro ball. And he liked me. And, uh, he said, uh, would you help me in my youth league, uh, meaning the Little League? And I coached when I was 14 and 15, you know, kids that were 11 and 12, and I really fell in love with it. He thought that I had a lot of potential, and of course I really admired him. And I got started, and I never did anything. I never sold a car. What did your folks home. think when, when it dawned on them that not a <laughs> doctor, not a lawyer, but for goodness <laughs> sakes, a baseball coach? Well, actually... My mother and father, uh, my mother from, uh, immigrated from Minsk, Russia, and my dad from Estonia. And of course, they never went to uh, college. And just to have a, a, a family member go to college was a big thing. But to be a teacher, so a school teacher and coach, was one play. They admired my high school baseball coach and all coaches. So uh, they thought it was terrific that I could go to college and be a teacher. So you ran into no resistance? Oh, not at all. Uh, so, Coach, uh, you got your degree at University of Miami, right. and then a master's, I think, That's right. there. And uh, what was your first coaching job? You graduate, you have your degrees. Where do you start? Well, at the time I uh, graduated, I stayed in graduate school to get a master's degree because it was very tough to get a job in Dade County, Florida at that time, but especially a coaching job. And I uh, took an elementary school uh, teaching position and uh, God uh, was good to me there as well because uh, that's where I met Sandy. And she taught at that school. And uh, we, I started there in August, and uh, we were engaged in November and planned to get married in February. And we took a little uh, vacation. In those days in Miami Beach, Florida, I would work as a social counselor in one of the big hotels over the Easter or Christmas break. And it was pretty good money, and I took Sandy in there because they need a lot of teachers. And, of course, somebody, a kid, an eight-year-old student of Sandy's, uh, came in and said, uh, there's uh, Miss Schwartz, her maiden name, of course, and Mr. Bertman. You know, they're getting married, Mom, but they're taking their honeymoon now. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. <laughs> but uh, so that's how quick. I only lasted one year in the elementary, and then I was uh, blessed again, and I went to my alma mater which is Miami Beach High School, where I coach football and uh, baseball, which I had always seen myself do, always wanted to be there. And, How do you uh, like coaching football? Oh, I love it. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, whenever I hire a coach or talk to a coach, I say to them, have you coached football? And they always, uh, now the youngsters always say, well, no, and they ask why, because uh, Gus, football is the essence of all coaching. In football, uh, they have... Uh, you know, 16 coaches, you know, the left tackle going to his left coach. You know, a defensive secretary that just types for a particular coach. You know, they don't miss a thing. Uh, you know, $100,000 worth of video equipment, so they won't miss a thing. But uh, I had a, a good high school football coach who was also my coach, was the head coach, and he taught me a lot about coaching, see, about detail. 
say about the sense of urgency, about the law of average, about odds. And in football, it's very easy to see that. In baseball, if you throw the ball out, they can all play. In basketball, if you roll it out, they'll start a game with three on three or five on five. But if the football team is left without a coach, they'll just sit there. Pitch. They can't. Yeah, they can't operate without coaching. And uh, in a sense, it, it is the essence of all coaching. It's what coaching is all about. So after you, so you coach in high school. How long does this last? I coached uh, in the at Miami Beach High School for uh, twelve years. And uh, successful team. I, yes, and uh, I naturally wanted to move on. Uh, very tough to get a college job though in those days. And what I decided to do was to write a book and uh, take a year off and uh, do some other things, and I did. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, about that time, uh, Ron Frazier from the University of Miami had contacted me and said, uh, come on here with me. And about that time, I had been offered a job as a city, by the city manager as a superintendent of recreation. Pretty and, good job. Yeah, real good. Yeah. Uh, at a lot more money than I was making as a teacher, but much more than what Ron could offer me. And uh, that's where my wife came in again, and, and my family and a lot of friends said, uh, don't give up what you love. And, and I've always been a guy, never interested in money, and a guy uh, that, well, if you really want to do it, you can do it. And, and so I went with Ron. Of course, that was the greatest uh, move that I had made. And I took a huge pay cut, but we worked it back up. I stayed at the University of Miami for uh, eight years. I had many job opportunities once I was at Miami. But having grown up there, having four daughters, as you know, I uh, didn't want to move. I thought it would be very difficult. So uh, what happened was uh, Bob Broadhead called in 1982. Do you remember the, uh, the instance? Do you remember the, the moment when you got that I call? I sure do. And uh, I was very impressed. I didn't know who, people don't believe this, but I didn't know Broadhead. He was a finance director for the football team. And the I, Dolphins. The Dolphins, and I really didn't know him. But he'd read the newspaper, and he thought that I'd be a good guy. But up here, um, uh, I wasn't ready to go, and I, I told him so. There was a little bit of a, it uh, wasn't clear. And I said, well, maybe next year. And then in uh, the following year, of course, he called back. I came up for a visit. I had been here before. In 1977, Ron Frazier and I came up here with the University of Miami team, went right to Alec Box Stadium and played. I was very impressed. Uh, then baseball coach Jim Smith, a wonderful guy, uh, showed us around. And I thought, my God, what a beautiful place this is. Really? And what a chance this has to be good. And I went back, and then when Broadhead called, I said, my God, that's odd. And I had turned down several other jobs, but uh, there was something about this place that I knew uh, a vision, you know, uh, it was clear to me that this could be a uh, powerhouse uh, baseball program. Coach, uh, baseball was so innocuous at that time. You, 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 had, you really were mostly going on faith and, and some confidence mm -hmm. in, in your own ability because there must have not been many ostensible signs, though, that what has happened would happen. <laughs> That's true. A lot of people tell me they never went to a baseball game unless they wanted a quiet place to study, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true. At the time I visited, and uh, LSU was playing Alabama, there were only accounted maybe 278 people. And um, they were angry, the fans. Uh, they didn't stand up. They didn't cheer. Honest to God, uh, Gus, I could hear. It was so quiet. I could hear the runner's spikes turn up the turf as he ran to first base. I mean, it was a weird feeling for me because the crowds at Miami were very large. But I thought that I could take the system, and I thought that I could uh, uh, make it work. Um, the Southeastern Conference was a chance. It was ripe. Uh, I wanted to be a head coach. Uh, I didn't want to wait for Ron to step down. And uh, I thought it was real good. I had my wife visit. She really liked it. and uh, We decided uh, to make a move. Did you immediately put in the Bertman system did you begin that? Because then I'm going. The next question I'm going to ask you is, what is the Berkman system? You know, I, I, you hear that mentioned very often, mostly by uh, uh, envious and admiring people. So I'm going to ask you first: Did you immediately begin to initiate that quotation mark system? Yes, I did. I started immediately with uh, the first thing about the system is it requires a fan base, uh, requires you know community support, uh, as well as administrative support. And I went out into the community for a coaches committee, uh, a booster group, if you will. 
and I got 17 guys, and most of them were former players and uh, here from years back, and they were excited about my enthusiasm. So, and they came in, and, and it worked real well, and now we have over 500 in that club, and of course that money uh, gives you a little extra. But more important than that is the fact that these people get to meet the players and really get involved in the uh, program. And the reason is the system says that our product, does, is in the baseball player, is the best NCAA product that college athletics has to offer. They graduate, they're super duper with people. Uh, they come from generally uh, homes in which mom and dad wanted them to succeed and have been with them ever since, showed them a lot of support. And they're uh, great kids, they'll do clinics, visit hospitals, I mean at all schools, not just LSU. So what, when Skip Burton steps into a home, what, what are you looking for, player-wise? Well, uh, actually, in baseball recruiting, uh, unlike football, I don't step into many homes. I see. Uh, either do many other coaches. Uh, generally speaking, uh, professional baseball scouts uh, relay the information to you, and then we all know who's going to be the best. But it's the hardest sport to project the player's athletic ability. You don't have to be six foot six. You don't have to bench press 300 pounds. You don't even have to run real fast. But you can still be a great college baseball player. So I always told my coaches, uh, uh, when you talk to them, are they looking into your eyes? Do they, or do they look down through your shoe, their shoes? Uh, how are their parents? Uh, what kind of home is it? Uh, because the truth is, it's very hard to tell. So I've uh, been fortunate, and we've won with kids that weren't even drafted professionally in many cases, and uh, because they're good kids, and uh, they're solid citizens, and those are the kids that you can ask the extra stuff from. And the system says that, uh, a lot of extra things will be asked of you. I want to ask you a question, and I'm not going to pin you down to names. Have any of those kids over the years been great disappointments to you? I've had, um, yeah, several kids, uh, say, say here uh, in Louisiana, I thought would be much better players, uh, and in a case or two, even better people, although I usually don't miss much on that one. Um, but it was early, and, and they hadn't been trained well. And uh, you know, they weren't able to accept failure. Uh, they weren't able to accept success. And uh, they didn't really know how to compete. You know, they did it mostly for themselves instead of for someone else or something higher than themselves. And uh, those kids fail very often. And you see that in the big leagues uh, and in all professional sports very often. So I, I had a few of those, uh, but not too many. You talked about they do it for a higher purpose. How in, in, in goodness sakes do you interject into a game a higher purpose? What, in other words, where does the higher purpose enter the picture? Okay. The, uh, that's, that's, that's exactly uh, well put. Uh, it's just a game. I mean, if your self-esteem is wrapped up in your bat or in your throwing arm, you have no chance because it's a game of failure. And then you must fail and you have to learn how to accept that and grow from your failure and say, you know, how did I get this far? What have I learned? You know, what can I learn? How far can I go? And the, uh, the best way to do it is to bring the 35 or 40 guys into a team. And that's the higher purpose. Where the goal for all 45 of us, including the coaches and trainers and so on, is a higher purpose than any individual goal. Higher than you making the big leagues. You know, higher than your batting That's average. That's quite a trick to pull it that is. off. It is. It, it, it can, I doubt if it can be done at the big league level, uh, but in college, uh, it can be done. And I think that's the secret uh, uh, to what success we've had. I can get the kids to believe in one another, to have a vision, to believe in LSU, to realize they represent a great school, you know, their parents, the community, their maker, and make sure that they play like that and they represent the, the team off the field like that as well. And then if something should go wrong, they make a bad choice. We'll support them, but when they do that, they let down the team, see, the system. And uh, as a result, uh, kids are very, uh, well, they're very uh, by their peers, you see. Held uh, up to accountability by their peers is probably the toughest accountability there is. How does Skip Bertman handle defeat? Oh, you've had so few, you probably have no answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, uh, I'm not uh, the best at that. You know, uh, I try 
you know, to make sure I can shake it very quickly uh, and bring a team back from defeat or bring them down from victory very quickly. And of course, the leader uh, has to do that at any level or a CEO in any business. But uh, sometimes it, it grates me if there was something that I could have done personally within that defeat by just moving the runner at the right time or pulling the pitcher at the right time or something I could have done. I'm very tough on myself. But, uh, but I bounce back the next day very, very well. And uh, that's, that's yesterday's, that's a canceled uh, check. That's but yesterday. you don't have the luxury of not bouncing back, that's do correct. you? You've got 40 eyes, 40 that's pairs correct. of eyes looking at you. That's correct. They, and uh, they do. They mimic you. And remember, these kids will, uh, they could uh, talk like a coach or, you know, they could act like a coach. They could mimic the coach very easily because we're together, you know, very often. But more importantly, we're together in very teachable moments, you know, like right before a ball game. Uh, 10 minutes before a ball game, 45 minutes in the locker room, uh, you have their attention. I mean, they want to hear. That's when self-doubts occur and fears are there. What, Coach, what if I don't make it? Or, Coach, what if I'm the GOAT today? Uh, we win so much. What if today we don't win? And the success of the program has a tendency to put a little fear in your heart, and, and they have to learn how to master that fear and uh, realize that it's good. They've trained for it, and it's good. That kind of fear, I'm sure, is there before just about everybody competing, whether it's a courtroom or even a doctor who's doing surgery. So, Coach, psychologically, the mind appears in your scheme of things to even be more important than the technical skills. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I'm big on that. And other coaches call all the time and they say, uh, Coach, how do you do it? What about the pitch? How do you hold this pitch? You know, wh wh what do you do with this pitch? Or, or where do you hold your hands when you bat? And I say, well, I, I, that's important. Those things are really important. But it's more important than what the kid thinks. See, what he sees before he pitches or before he hits. Uh, how he handles it when he swings and misses or the umpire calls a pitch outside a strike. That's more important because uh, kids hit with all funny stances and succeed. Big kids, skinny kids, short kids. I mean, obviously, that's not the answer. The answer is here and here. When you send a young pitcher out there and he gets clobbed, it's not his night. How do you address him or approach him the next day or that night, whenever? Okay, well, that's, uh, that's a great question. And uh, the answer, of course, is you know, you've got to be very sensitive and realize how much it means to the kids. The kids are so, uh, uh, you know, they want to win so badly and they want to be successful so badly that uh, when it doesn't happen, that instant gratification isn't there. You have to turn that defeat around so that it will learn something so it can be a victory. So what I do. Uh, after going to the mound, and I say to them, pitcher, usually, hey, uh, so-and-so, we're going to make a pitching change. Uh, now, you know, it's a good chance for so-and-so to get in and see what he could do. He did a good job. All right, and I usually say that all the time. Uh, and when they get back, uh, we recap after the game. And if we had lost, I never talked to them after the game, about the game, that night. But if we win, I may go over a lot of things uh, that night. Um, if uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take all the positives I can out of that game. I'll find pitches. And Something video, good. Yeah, I'll find videotape where he threw a great pitch, even if it's one. <laughs> and I'll show that five times or six times. And I'll fire him up and get him ready for the next ball game. And, uh, you know, one, one, once Earl Weaver said, uh, I guess the manager's job in the big leagues is to keep the five guys who really don't like you, you see, away from the five or ten guys that are undecided. <laughs> but in reality, in college ball, they'll give you the benefit of the doubt. And it's nothing like professional ball. I don't know anything about professional baseball. Uh, it's nothing like that. And, and the kids all like you and respect you and like one another. I'll go a little further. In many cases, they really do love one another. Uh, we can have a reunion and all the kids will show up. I mean, they'll fly in from wherever. Uh, it means a lot to them and I think that's probably the keynote of our system is T-E-A-M. You know, Coach, one of the things that I personally would dislike most about your profession, Coach, you put together these youngsters, and suddenly you've got a brilliant team, and you say to yourself, I've got these guys needed for as much as two, and here come the pros, and draft them. Mm -hmm. What kind of a feeling is that to see your talent just choo, gone? On television uh, about a month ago, Jerry Stackhouse from the NBA and Mike Krzyzewski, the coach at Duke, were on Nightline. I mean the big one. And they were very concerned because 35 guys 
left Division I college basketball a year ago, not this past year. Uh, Gus, every year, oh, six to 800 guys do that in baseball. But um, nobody seems to care much about uh, whether it's done in baseball or gymnastics or swimming or golf or tennis because all the money, all the television, all the revenues, and of course all the notoriety is in your football program or in your basketball program, and I can certainly live with that and understand. Most of our kids uh, do graduate, but uh, uh, the pros do come in and offer a million dollars to some guy who was a junior who could forego his senior year. And I really can't in good conscience and honesty say that the kid has to stay. I mean, he could come back. But I would like to add, uh, Gus, that kids leave college for many reasons, in theater, in music, in business, like Bill Gates and others, in which they uh, have a plan that's going to work right now. And uh, it is a tough thing. And, uh, but we're, gonna, we're getting a lot of attention now because they're doing it in basketball and football. Now. I thought the most tragic thing that I observed in, in college basketball were the, the guys who, from the day they stepped into LSU and onto the court, uh, thought that they were going to play pro, and and that uh, was not meant to be. Uh, they didn't get the breaks. They didn't have the talent, mm -hmm. whatever. That that has to be. That's probably very harmful to a kid. Yes, it is. Uh, when I start, uh, I think part of the biggest thing going is to bring the kid down. So before you can build them back up. You're not Babe Ruth. That's right. Yeah, right. that's right. You're not Babe Ruth, and at only two percent. All the guys who play professional baseball ever make the big leagues for four years. Only 5% ever make the big leagues at all. And then they look around and say, yeah, but look at all those pictures on the wall, you know. But you can do it, but you got to start at the very bottom. you got to work your way up. Coach, you've sent, uh, what, about 80 players to the big leagues, and you've kept contact with them. I want to ask you, for the most part, is the big, does the big league experience make them better men? Does it maintain uh, where they were? Or have you even seen some deterioration? Oh, another great question. Uh, of all the guys I've seen going to professional baseball and for those that have made it to the big leagues, uh, the answer to that question, Gus, is if they were good kids before they went to play, they're still good kids. If they weren't, it tears them down worse. Uh, you have to be very, very strong to play up there. Uh, the bad words that are written or said from the stands and uh, appear on TV uh, are magnified a million fold. Gosh, that's a tough thing, Gus. Yeah. Have you ever been tempted to, uh, and I know you've had opportunities to go into the pros yourself? Uh, no, I have had some opportunities, but no, that's not for me. Uh, certainly not in the coaching aspect. And the reason, of course, is uh, number one is I don't know anything about the, the way the pros play. It's a different game than the one we play with aluminum bats and different kind of kids. Uh, I'm a motivator and a believer. Uh, Is there motivation in the big leagues? Uh, Can you address nah. those guys and the team spirit, etc.? cetera? No, nah, I don't think so. Uh, they play, you know, literally, you know, 160 games a year. And they play every single day for seven months. You know, I once talked uh -huh. to a uh, professional defensive coordinator met him on an airplane, and I said, what's your greatest problem in the pros? And he said, everyone knows everyone else's salary. <laughs> I thought that was, uh, Coach, what are your future plans? Well, uh, Joe Dean uh, was very gracious to me, and, uh, you know, I'm going to stay through 99 for sure. And uh, I guess I don't know after that. I'm, I'm looking maybe I could stay uh, and coach some more, uh, and that's certainly a possibility. But I want to leave it open so I could do something else. I, mean, I think there's something else for me to do out there, whether it's in business or uh, speaking and writing or something else. And I think I'd like to give it a shot. So life won't end when, when, when you step back from <laughs> coaching, is that right? Oh, not for me. No, 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 not at all. And, and, and you know, there, and another guy can step in and he can just continue and, and it can be great forever. He better continue. <laughs> uh, whoever steps in, if they bring in, I don't uh, care who. I don't envy the shoes that he's going to attempt to fill. No, in baseball, a guy can step in and do it because in baseball, you can control the game a little bit in your hands. Coach, that's the only thing you and I are going to disagree on, but we're going to disagree. <laughs> and I want to tell our friends that uh, yesterday, uh, Coach and Ms. Bertman became grandparents for the first time, and congratulations. Thank you, and congratulations to you, too, Thank Grandpa. you. I also, a few weeks ago, 
a son of your grandfather. Son. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> what happened? I, I had nothing but black hair, and you had a lot of hair. <laughs> Coach, thank you so much. Gus, it's been a pleasure. Fine, son. Louisiana Legends is made possible by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. This important program series enables us to discover, through the accomplishments of our fellow Louisianians, the unique character of the state so proudly served by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana for 60 years. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or send 1995 to Louisiana Legends, care of Louisiana Public Broadcasting, 7860 and Selmo Lane, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 70810. Please allow four to six weeks for delivery.